Um, tonight, we're here to find out about restorative ocean economies. This program is brought to us by Aaron Axelrod and Kevin Bayouk from the Lyft Economy. Lyft's <laughs> Lyft's mission is to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life. And tonight, we're going to learn about what's already being done, what is possible, and what we can all do locally near California coast to restore, regenerate, and reimagine a mutually beneficial relationship of humans and our maritime environment. So we're going to start out with a video of Bren Smith, and then I'll turn the night over to Aaron. Thank you all for being here. Big round of applause for Amy and the Presidio for sponsoring this event. And to you all for being here. Thank you so much. So we're actually going to let Bren speak first because, um, yeah. I mean, when I started this, I was getting laughed off the water by my fellow fishermen. And everybody was joking around that I was, you know, growing hemp under the ocean and no one, this stuff was disgusting and, you know, why would you ever do this? And now we have folks just flooding towards us. We have requests to start farms in every coastal state in North America and 40 countries around the world. There he is. How you doing? Good. 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 You know, kelp is a little embarrassing to grow for a for a fisherman. You know, I, ch I chase and kill things for a living, and now I'm like an arugula farmer, and so it's a big shift. But kelp really is what the oceans provide. So my name is Bren Smith. I'm the owner of Thimble Island Ocean Farm and executive director of Green Wave. And I'm, this is my 30th year working the ocean. I was born and raised in Newfoundland, Canada. Dropped out of high school when I was 14 and headed out to sea. And I really spent the first third of my life just fishing the globe. I fished the Grand Banks, George's Banks. I had to do a Bering Sea for quite a, a bunch of years. And, um, you know, that was the height of overfishing. There was, you know, we were pillaging the, the oceans, tearing up entire ecosystems. And I, but I was a kid, and it uh, really gave me a lot of incredible sense of meaning to help feed my country and be on the water. And that's kind of been the goal over my whole life is how do we figure out that so people like me and other fishermen and even land-based farmers can, can have their own farms, have self-directed lives, and, and um, you know, spend their, make their livelihoods out in the water. While I was working on the Bering Sea, this, the cod stalks crashed back home where I was born in Newfoundland. And that was a real wake-up call for a whole generation of us. And so me and a bunch of people my age went on this search for sustainability. And I ended up in the uh, aquaculture farms in northern Canada because aquaculture was supposed to be the answer to overfishing, job creation. But when I got there, it was the exact opposite. It was, it was an industrial mode of for, uh, food production. We used to say we're growing neither fish nor food. So uh, I ended up here in Long Island Sound uh, as I kept searching for a new way to, to farm the ocean. And I re remade myself as a shell fisherman, and I started with oysters. And I did that for about eight years, and then the storms hit. Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy were really brutal. They were, you know, they were two very hard years having the farm wiped out, 90% of my crop lost, and most of my gear. And after, uh, I think it was Irene, I went out too early to go to, sa to try to save the farm and I started pulling gear and uh, 
uh, I, I ended up getting blown into the rocks and had to be, uh, you know, uh, saved by the Coast Guard. And that was just me just wanting to save what I had in the, in, in the face of uh, climate change. But I was farming in the wrong way then is what it turned out and that's why I had to adapt. After the storms hit, I had to reimagine what it was to be an ocean farmer. And so I began trying to grow different species, species that were more resilient, uh, species that were actually more affordable to grow. And I lifted my farm off bottom using the entire water column, which made me resilient to storm surges. And I started growing species that were restorative, uh, like oysters, but many, many more. And the idea was really how many different species can we grow in a 20 acre area. And the idea is just to make this as affordable as possible for farmers to, to do and do themselves. So it's just minimal skills and, and minimal capital costs. I'm saying this is, we think of this as the nail salon model of the sea. And simplicity is really the secret to replication. You know, you, you come out on the farm and there's kind of nothing to see. But, you know, that's a good thing. It's all underwater, low aesthetic impact, small footprint. Um, but if you can imagine an underwater garden. So the farm it is imagine a sort of simple scaffolding system underwater where you have hurricane proof anchors on the edges and then just about eight feet below the surface you have a horizontal rope and we so we'll have our kelp growing vertically um, uh, down on the lines next to scallops and lantern nets, next to mussels and mussel socks, and then below the surface we have oyster, our oysters in cages and clams down in the mud. Scientists call it IMTA, Integrated Multitropic uh, Aquaculture. The worst name I think anybody could have ever come up with. Uh, like, I mean, it's alienating uh, from the start. And so we're trying to create this whole new dialect around ocean farming. So we decided on 3D ocean farming because it's an idea, I think, that captures people's imagination. They don't know what it is at first, but it gets them to lean forward. Just taking some of this slack to like right here. The growing season, uh, kelp is a winter crop. It's why we love it. It goes in post-hurricane season, one of the fastest growing plants on Earth. Um, so we seed that around November and it, it grows. We start harvesting in the spring. We pull the kelp off the lines to process, and right then we have mussel sets, little mussel seeds that come and attach to those old pieces of the kelp stems. And they grow out, and we take that seed and put them in mussel socks, and we attach those mussel socks to those old kelp lines. So really efficient use of gear. The scallops, we're harvesting those in as mini scallops, again, just before kelp comes. Oysters uh, are year-round and then clams are mainly in the spring and summer. So we're able to harvest something all year round. We have diversification, which reduces risk for us as farmers if one of our uh, crops fail. All right, and then turn it up. I'm on it. Oops. Got it. Okay, you grab the line, then walk down it, clip it. So these are our muscle socks here. And we love mussels, they're packed full of omega-3s, it's lean proteins, so such an efficient use of gear, rotational crop, really simple. And then what the mussels do is they push through the netting and they grow on the outside and then we get those the, the delicious mussels. We harvest those just before kelp season. Regenerative agriculture to me is trying to answer the question of how do we farm the ocean in a different way? How do we revive ecosystems through our farming methods? So my job isn't to save the seas. It's it, because Mother Nature millions of years ago created two technologies actually designed to mitigate our harm, shellfish and seaweeds. 
A shellfish, our oysters soak up uh, uh, incredible amounts of nitrogen. They filter over 50 gallons of water a day. Our kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. I mean, there are studies coming out that says if you were to have farms covering 6% of the oceans, you could capture all the carbon that's currently put out by humanity and feed the planet. Kelp is a type of seaweed. There are over 200 varieties um, in our waters, and uh, it's a brown algae. Ours is called sugar kelp. The interesting thing about kelp and why I see it as a great gateway drug for the future of sea greens is that our kelp is really mild tasting. It's in the, uh, uh, the southern edge of a sugar kelp. You blanch it and it turns this bright green, so it's a really nice aesthetic. We turn it into noodles. So what we're making here is our kelp noodles, which are, uh, uh, we find is, uh, it sells out in New York City all the time. One of the best dishes we do is a barbecue kelp noodles with parsnips and breadcrumbs. And we like it because the kelp uh, freezes for up to five years, so um, it has incredible shelf life. And when you thaw it, it stays al dente. And it's also bright green, so the aesthetics are uh, really great. So Asa here, who's the operations manager, is going to start making some kelp noodles. The other thing that's interesting about kelp specifically, uh, kelp can be used for animal feed. It's like a soy or a corn without the destructive uh, impacts. Kelp is also used in pharmaceuticals, in cosmetics, as fertilizers. The biofuel potential, if you were to take a network of farms totaling the size of the state of Maine, you could replace all the oil in the United States. As we scale this, now some of it might work, some of it might not, but it shows the possibility and the promise as we move out into our oceans and, and you know, do agriculture the, the right way. This isn't just some little like, you know, tiny thing, we're gonna do it in restaurants in New York. If we care about building a vibrant economy, this has to be able to scale. Because we can grow huge amounts of food in small places, like 10 to 30 um, uh, tons of seaweed, 250,000 shellfish per acre, the uh, impact on food security can be um, uh, really significant. If you were to take a network of our farms totaling the size of Washington State, you could feed the world. The other, th you know, the other piece is we cr create thousands and thousands of jobs. I mean, one of our small farms creates two to three full-time jobs and seven to ten seasonal jobs. You put together thousands of farms dotting our, dotting our coastline. I mean, that, that's a significant workforce that's not just in the service sector. It's not just working in cubicles. It's actually jobs where people have a sense of meaning. They have their own farms. and. They're good wages, wages where people can send their kids to college and really address some of the real injustices that have evolved out of the old, old economy. You know, I spent 15 years developing my model. It took a long time, a lot of mistakes, errors. Um, it was kind of a mess, tons of experimentation. Um, but what emerged was 3D ocean farming. Thousands of people started coming, um, asking to start their own farms, wanting to be involved, wanting to help do their research. So we started Green Wave. Green Wave does three things. Trying to build this industry from the bottom up by one, training new, a new generation of farmers. Second, building the infrastructure on land. So we build the hatcheries, the seafood hubs, so that farmers can capture more of that value chain. And then the last piece is R&D and science. All that um, innovation that's required uh, to expand markets. I think the economic potential is huge. Our farmers can do extremely well. They can uh, gross up to $300,000 for their farms. And, and then what they grow can cre create an entire uh, range of different um, opportunities for entrepreneurs. So we can do the kelp raised beef, we can do fertilizers, we can do new pharmaceuticals, uh, bouillon cubes, I mean it's just infinite because it is like the soy of the sea. And then you start getting to a point 
that's at scale we, where you can actually participate uh, in the national and the global economy. And I think that's where we you know, really hope to big. It's a, it's a big dream, but I think we can pull it off. to show that first because as you can see it really encapsulates why many of you in your hearts are probably here today. How many of you were at the Bioneers presentation that Bren gave last fall? Okay, so just just a few of you. Great. So as Amy so beautifully mentioned, my name is Erin Axelrod. I'm a partner at Lyft Economy and um, like my colleagues Andrew Baskin and Kevin Bayouk, we have been, um, we work with enterprises of all shapes and sizes, so not just aquaculture focused. We work with um, really the social enterprises that are at the forefront of building an economy that works for all life, not just humans or not just profit. And um, so in our work, we, we work with farmers and ranchers and people making material um, goods in a regenerative way. And we have been tracking this um, mariculture and, and, um, and oceans and estuary systems actually um, from the amateur practitioner standpoint from a long, a long time. I um, went on my first seaweed foray with um, Heidi, Strong Arm Farms, who's here in the room today, and um, learned about how incredible seaweed is for our health and vitality. Um, and so we've been, from a very amateur standpoint, uh, following uh, how important our ocean ecosystems are not just for our health, um, our, but also the health of the world around us. And so before Bren came in October of last year, we had actually been watching what he was doing for a couple years um, and really intrigued about this vision of, of really plugging in the economic dynamics too, to the restoration. Um, and that's really the intention of tonight, too, is, is to set up and, and posit that our businesses can actually be active catalysts for regeneration. Um, and, and so when last fall, when Bren did come and visit in October, we had the opportunity to connect with him at a couple other events where we were, um, we became more familiar with some of the um, opportunities, but also some of the challenges around actually implementing his model here in California. Um, it, we've, we've also been working with other practitioners in this area. So Lift Economy works with Hog Island Oyster Company, which uses their beautiful model of oyster production um, and is actually studying the carbon sequestration um, effects from a very specific um, academic framework. Um, of how those oyster beds are actually um, helping support the eelgrass uh, to, to return to Tamales Bay. Um, we also work with a company called North Coast Brewing Company um, that last year, through their donation uh, program, was able to donate um, tens of thousands of dollars to marine mammal research. And so the, um, the, this idea of an, an ecosystem of businesses that can actually um, restore the health and vitality of our oceans is, is really what, what we're inspired by and what, what inspired this event, which um, along the way, we have been working with John Rulak. And John is, um, the, he is an ocean hero, ocean enthusiast, and very, very prescient climate thinker um, in terms of the relationship between a climate crisis and our oceans and soils. And so um, thanks to John, this, this idea emerged around creating an event 
um, that would actually help us all to have a shared language and shared literacy around what Bren's model on the East Coast means for California. And, um, you know, Lyft has always been an advocate for place-based solutions, so we really recognize that it's, it is going to look somewhat different in California, and so how do, how do we as Californians and uh, practitioners on the West Coast um, and, and advocates on the West Coast come to a shared understanding of, of what the next steps are? Um, so thank you so much to Nativa and the Presidio Trust for sponsoring and hosting us and, and making this, this possible. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to pass it on to Kevin Bayouk, the co-founder of Lift Economy, to say a few words as well. Thanks, Aaron. Um, just to build off of what Aaron said, uh, I think what inspired the, the, this convening, which might be the start of a future dialogue moving from shared language to shared strategies towards actually implementation and scaling of a diverse array of practices. One thing I want to highlight is that partnering with our estuary ecosystems, our open ocean, our shorelines, and our watersheds uh, is uh, there, there's, it's not just the green wave model, which is certainly impressive, 10 to 30 tons of seaweed per acre, 250,000 shellfish, incre incredible yields with zero inputs, very impressive and exciting, I think. But here tonight, you'll hear about some uh, different stages and scale of possible partnership with our maritime ecosystems, um, some that are deep ocean ocean that are large scale, extraordinarily large scale, larger than scale than a regionally replicable model that Bren has discussed in this video. Um, and what we were surprised to learn in, uh, from Lyft Economy's perspective is actually how inchoate the ecosystem is around this type of creative and generative partnership with those uh, maritime ecosystems. Meaning uh, we do some work uh, working with philanthropists and investors trying to catalyze uh, communities to move into this type of climate change solution oriented uh, enterprise practices. And we've done that in regenerative agriculture and other spaces. And when we started surveying uh, some of our uh, family office partners and friends and investors, uh, we found that there was very little literacy. Greenwave, with that impressive portfolio of implementation, is at this moment in need, um, dire need, to have funding just to continue their operation and to expand into California, um, which was surprising to us. Uh, considering how uh, ostensibly impressive their yields are and what they're, where, where they're at. So tonight is shared literacy um, about uh, what's currently happening and about what's possible. And so we'll have a, a couple of short speakers who kind of represent what's actually happening on the ground um, here in California and at large in the world. Um, just to represent that there's more happening than just uh, shell, near, near, near shore shellfish and kelp. There's uh, our, our, you know, everything from our mangroves to our corals to our open ocean. Um, and so we'll get some more ideas about what's possible and uh, then we'll break out actually into discussion so that your voices can be expressed. So we'll have two groups uh, after we have a couple speakers um, that we can actually share a dialogue to actually identify what are the next steps that we can take as individuals or maybe you're here just to learn and absorb. In the spirit of that, we do believe this is probably a beginning and not an ending tonight. So Aaron and I have prepared a series of follow-up information um, opportunities. We'll highlight uh, some of what comes out of the discussions tonight. And we also have a collection of resources that we'll share. And there's a couple individuals in the room who are both writing books and writing papers. And we might announce those uh, because they're forthcoming. So to keep our literacy you know, at, at a level of uh, continuity and then uh, uh, making sure that we're sharing in strategies. Um, do you want to, should we move into the speakers? Great. You wanna, okay. So 
as a part of our inquiry into what is possible, I had the opportunity in April to actually make a little trip down the coast of California um, and interview people that are actually actively trying to make these solutions work on the ground. And one of whom is Dan Marquez, who was um, on, on the video credits there and has worked very, very intensively with GreenWave um, and has ha actually built some of the hatchery systems that GreenWave um, you saw there in, in the video. Um, and Dan, I'll let you add to my introduction, but what I was so struck by um, uh, when meeting you is Dan has uh, really, he, he's been a lifelong inhabitant in Santa Barbara. He's lived there his whole life. And he is, um, uh, has worked for the UC Santa Barbara for um, how many years? 22 years um, as operations manager um, for their systems. And so that, hence the tie with GreenWave and really the ability to bring a lot of the technical expertise of how to implement um, these hatchery systems that are needed to foster this, this economic solution. Um, and I loved the story that I, I would love you to share, if you would, is, is just um, your perspective of knowing the, the kelp off, the, off your coastlines and just how they've changed in your lifetime and how that dr has driven you to, to, to do what you do now. So without further ado, please give a really warm welcome. We're so lucky to have Dan Marquez here to share his knowledge. So um, I'm a fourth generation Santa Barbara. Um, I have a uh, plumbing background, I went to uh, work for UCSB about 22, uh, 21 and a half years ago. And I started as a plumber and worked my way up. Um, I also um, was in ch ended up being in charge of all mechanical, plumbing and electrical systems and underground utility systems for the campus. Now the reason this played as such an advantage for me is, is UCSB had one of the largest seawater systems on the west coast. So I at times repaired, I maintained, and I helped to design. Nothing yet? You're sleeping. Okay. Helped the design of uh, the seawater system, the largest seawater system on campus, and in many other seawater systems in the marine sciences labs. Um, my company is called Pharmacy. My wife came up with the name. I wish you could see it up there. It's with the spelled SEA at the very end of it. Um, also, we have um, Alma C. Beauty, which my wife also came up with. She's the real brains of the outfit, by the way. Um, Alma C. is a um, seaweed product um, for cosmetics that she came up with that is basically designed to fund the farm. We, you know, the people I've talked to so far in California, um, the one thing I told them that their first piece of homework to do is, well, first of all, you need to find a, a lease. Second thing you need to do is you need to figure out what to do with the kelp after you grow it. It's not gonna do any good just to grow kelp and not have any kind of market for it. Um, we came up with, a, on the cosmetic side, Bren does the food side. Okay, so, pharmacy? Pharmacy Beauty. Alrighty, so, and I gotta be careful because um, I've been held hostage by Fish and Wildlife for about the last, ooh, almost year and a half. I love the guys, but um, we've been going through a name change that's taken forever. And my consultant, Michael Murphy, is here today, is kind of warning me. In fact, Michael, be sure to buzz me if I say anything that I shouldn't be saying, okay? Um, yeah, I'm sorry? Yes, fish and wildlife are our friends. They are. I'm going to make them my best friend. I'm trying to make them my best friend, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, so it is a 25-acre a um, farm off the Elwood Pier. And the really cool thing is, as you can see right here on the, on the picture, so we got a 12 and 12 and 1. Now, the thing I found out the other day is I couldn't figure out for the life of me because the, the pier, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but basically ends right up there, okay? And I couldn't figure out the design of this, why they had this thing set up this way. 
Then I saw a picture back from the 70s, I think it was, or 80s. That pier used to come all the way down to here. So this parcel, this parcel is accessed through the pier. So now it's obviously not accessed. So there's a storm that came through, I believe it was 83, and took that section of the pier out, and they haven't replaced it. But um, that's our farm. And in case you guys, if you guys do know about Santa Barbara, this is actually Galita. Um, that's the Vaccaro Resort that you see up there. All the red out there, thank you. Um, that's the Vaccaro Resort, if, if, if you guys, if for reference point. And then UCSB is right about over here. So again, this 25 acre lease, um, right now, we're just going through the name change part. The name change, I started this, and I cannot hate to say this out loud, but we started this in December of 2015. The name change. On August of 16, it went in front of the committee, the Fish and Wildlife Committee, and it was passed as far as being approved for the name change. And kind of stopped from there. So luckily, with the help of Michael, and then, of course, Randy, who was in charge of uh, Mariculture for the state of California, who was a tiny bit embarrassed right now, which is working towards my advantage, um, we're finally moving forward on, uh, on some of the issues with that. And it looks like, well, I guess I'm not going to really say because I've been, I've been told deadlines before and they haven't quite been met before by uh, Fish and Wildlife. So, but that's where we're at as far as the farm piece goes. Um, now, the green wave piece. Now, Bren is kind of my Yoda, and he's about the size of him too, by the way, okay? He is a little dude. Um, I, got it, I started working with Bren um, about three years ago. We actually, when we somewhat acquired this lease, we made contact with Bren, and Bren actually came out and spent three days with us at our house, which is pretty crazy considering his schedule. Uh, we went out to the farm, uh, location, um, he looked at some of the gear that I acquired, and um, we drank some wine, and we had a good time. Uh, so in June of last year, I went and saw Bren uh, back east, and basically I called him up saying, hey, look at your Yoda, and I need to get a little more training on this sea farming thing. My background's definitely not sea farming. And I knew I could pick it up if I just got my hands on it. That's kind of, I'm, I'm mechanically inclined. I liked something in my hands. So I went out there with him, and when I was out there, I, he showed me the processing hub that he had, just finished. And I chewed him out uh, pretty badly because the processing hub was put together so poorly, and plumbing was illegal. I mean, I, I can't believe the thing had, in, had uh, passed inspection. So I told him that I, you know, hey, you can, anything coming up next, I'll do it, you know, don't, hire these people around here because apparently they don't know what they're doing. And no offense to the East Coast, but. Uh, so, for Bryn, that's my baby. That's the hatchery. So I designed it and then I built it. I worked with a lab tech from Yukon. He worked for Charlie Yarish, Dr. Charlie Yarish. His name was Jonathan Gilbert. And basically, like a graduate student, um, I just, and this is what I did for UCSB, by the way, I just talked to him about what kind of systems need to be in place, what kind of systems do you need for safeties in place, and I took all that information and I kind of piled it into this thing. And for me, being the plumbing mechanical background, I really like that picture on that side with all the piping, kind of sexy to me anyways. It has about a thousand feet of pipe in this thing. There are 40 tanks, 20 chillers, 20 pumps, and um, and a whole lot of power, unfortunately. Um, the other interesting thing about building this for Bryn is that they were, the scientific world is very interesting, and I know I have some scientists here. Um, the hatchery system that they had developed, they've had the system going for years, so they never changed the actual hatchery system. They change all the experiments they do with the system, but they never change the system, and we're talking about something that's really archaic. So I was trying to bring this thing into the 21st century, but uh, this is the first time I did anything for Bren. He was kind of worried that I was going to, I don't know, design it out the, um, the factors that make it effective for growing kelp. 
which I knew I wouldn't, but I just to appease him, I, I drew it this way. So unfortunately, this thing's a bit of an energy pig. Um, I'm, Bren also mentions all the time in, the, in his videos, I don't know if you've seen him, he mentions a mobile hatchery. Well, that's also my design. I have it on, well, on drawings. I gave him a very basic drawing right now of it, but I figured a way I, to put this in a 20-foot to 40-foot container. I'm looking at using renewable energy. I've been challenged by the sustainability people at UCSB that I worked with for years as far as trying to have a zero footprint with this thing, which I think is extremely important. So the mobile hatchery will be a lot more effective, a lot more efficient than this thing. This thing cost him about $1,800 a month in electric bill when it was going full bore. And one of the problems, too, is that I try to tell him, you know, we need to at least go with dimmable ballast for the lighting system. And again, they didn't listen to me, unfortunately. And they were using uh, mesh to control the lumen output from the lights. Well, you have a full burn going with their lights, and you're trying to use all this mesh to do it. You know, it's just the heat load was incredible. The heat load from the chillers was incredible. And, I, and I, the other thing I mentioned to Brent before I started is like, guys, we need to get rid of the heat in here, but they couldn't afford to, to run an exhaust system in there. So it, was a, it works, but the water is held at 50 degrees, and it feels like a sauna when you walk inside that thing because it's so hot. So something, that, like I said, I've definitely figured out that how to you know, mitigate that problem in the mobile hatchery or any other hatchery I built. We just need a little bit more money and a little more confidence that I'm not going to build this thing out of spec. So it's been um, about two years of training with Bren. Um, we do kind of argue on some things. I think every one of us has a responsibility to be an environmentalist now, and that's one thing that Bren says we're not environmentalist. He's not an environmentalist, but I, I kind of argue with him about that piece. I think we have a responsibility. I don't think the ocean is going to be able to fix itself. We've done a lot of damage to it. I think we can definitely help it by growing kelp, a lot of kelp. Um, it is the filtration system for the ocean. Um, one of the other problems that's been going on on this coast is the domoic acid breakout. And domoic, it's just, that's just another algae, guys. That's all it is. The problem is, is that it is a bad algae, like a weed, that has no competition for the food source. And a good competition for that food source is kelp. So we, done it. we had a 90% plus loss in Mendocino County, I believe it was last year, on the kelp wars, which it was just shocking. I saw pictures of abalone crawling up stalks of bull kelp, starving, looking for food. Urchins all over the floor looking for food. You know, so, and when you start seeing, you know, to me, it, it was heartbreaking to see these crab fishermen who are hard working, honest people who could not go out there and make a living, not because they didn't want to, but because of the conditions of the ocean that unfortunately we've been a part of. So, growing kelp, I really believe, will help with this solution. One of, one of the solutions for um, the domoic acid breakout. It's not going to solve it because it's always been there. Um, what I think it'll do is I'll just keep it in check so it's not as large of a breakout. And I've been talking with uh, several scientists at UCSB about that. So, so basically what we're about, we're about restorative ocean farming, by the way. I mean, I'm trying to find another word other than farming. Um, in this country, farming, um, unfortunately, is a monocrop, destructive type of of um, farming that I, you know, I don't, I don't like it. I think we have a chance, guys. We have a chance right now to put the ocean, um, to farm the ocean correctly. We have a chance to do it where it's not huge industry. We have a chance to do it where um, we're protecting it and think about it, and we have a chance to grow it instead of having a, these huge monocrop kind of things as having a complete. Uh, ecosystem grow right there. The, the cool thing about, we're, gonna, we're planning on growing uh, mac macrocystis, which is giant kelp. Um, the nice thing about giant kelp is I just have to give it a haircut if I need any of the kelp. You know, literally, it grows on good conditions, one to three feet a day, 
uh, with um, the proper nutrition and um, the coldness of the water. One to three feet a day. So I don't need that much kelp for what I'm doing for my product, one thing. I don't think there's anybody who needs that much kelp. And again, like I said, all we have to do is give it a haircut. And then the other thing that Bren mentions, which he's correct, is the sequestration part of kelp. It, it uh, sequesters more, more carbon than trees. It's like the sequoia of the ocean. It's incredible to do. Now, now the thing that I've been working with is, because I started asking questions with our scientists at UCSB is, well, well, what if you eat the kelp? Well, if you grow it, grab that carbon and eat it, you're basically putting that carbon back into the atmosphere again. We do. Um, if the kelp makes it on the beach and starts to decay, same thing. So um, when, when I was talking to the scientists at UCSB, one of the things that they said is, two minutes, holy cow, um, is that uh, we need to refossilize this kelp, uh, saturate it with the carbon, and then send it to the bottom of the ocean. So what we want to do is we want to replant and restore ocean kelp forest, um, create a habitat that supports marine life, assist in uh, climate stabilization efforts and mitigate ocean acidification, establish an American seaweed industry, and help turn sea farming into a viable and financially uh, feasible uh, business. I think this all can be done. Uh, the kelp harvesting therapy it creates jobs. Uh, we can establish responsible and sustainable harvesting uh, business practices, create consumer markets for kelp, uh, research and development of kelp techniques. I'm going to kind of blow through these now, guys, because I, I got the. So that's me. <laughs> uh, the seawater technology part of pharmacy was to provide innovative, cost effective, and eco technological, technological solutions for an emerging aquaculture industry, uh, facilities, consultation, design, management, and implementation of modern technologies for seawater systems, facilitate collaborative industry efforts. Uh, our long-term goals is, of course, this is my like dream, is uh, you know develop a California Seaweed Coalition. Well, actually, we already started that thanks to Michael, and there's some people in this audience tonight that are part of that coalition. Um, relationship between, and we're also trying to uh, do a, um, a relationship between agencies and farmers, which could be really, really important. Assist in establishing kelp farms up and down the California coast. Again, my goal is kelp, guys, is the filtration system for the ocean. What I would love to see is one of these farms set up everywhere rivers um, and lakes or rivers and um, streams or anything dumps into the ocean. Anyway, we should have the kelp farm. And all these kelp farms will help clean the ocean because, again, like I said, this is kelp is the filtration system for the ocean. That simple. And that's it. Uh, deeply appreciative to Dan um, and for truncating that amazing presentation about what's actually happening um, in Southern California. I want to invite up uh, another presenter, um, Brian Von Herzen um, of uh, the Marine Permaculture. Um, and as a way of introduction, briefly, uh, I was part of a, a project that recently went into publication, I still am part of a project called Project Drawdown. It's a group of 70 uh, researchers, scientists around the world working on uh, measuring, mapping, and modeling the 80 top solutions uh, that are actually already in market, in practice, to global climate change. And in the publication of the book, we reserved a space for 20 solutions after reviewing some order of magnitude greater, 200, 300 different possible solutions to include as coming attractions. These are solutions that are extraordinarily important but don't yet have the peer-reviewed literature quantity um, uh, to justify as being considered one of the 80 self-evident uh, solutions that are in market today. And uh, one of the solutions that made the cut, that made the book, um, was is this, uh, what Brian is going to share with us. Um, and uh, the potential is enormous, and it kind of brings to the, the, our, our mindset that um, this near shore 
uh, ocean farming, as Dan and Bren have discussed, is just part of a mosaic of practices that are at different stages of development. Some of them need critical research and development, uh, philanthropy and funding. Some of them are investable enterprises and all over that spectrum. Um, and uh, Brian will enlighten us about the opportunity here with our open oceans. Thanks, Brian. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And I loved what Dan had to show tonight. And I think he asked exactly the right questions. And that is, how do we go from monocultural farming to polycultural environmental ecosystems? And in my search and research on this, I went back to Bill Mollison in 1959, who discovered permaculture in the forests of Tasmania, studying the marsupials and how they got everything they needed from the forest. And that was inspiring. It was the, also the year I was born. So I love that connection of being a, a climate baby in that sense. Um, marine permaculture, what does that mean? Permaculture is the idea of restoring ecosystems and being able to harness them to help nature and mankind. And that is, how can we sustainably live with that ecosystem in equilibrium and make it work? And then the question is, how do we do it in the sea? And for that inspiration, I go to the kelp forests of the world. And with that in mind, I'd like to show you a short two-minute film made by our filmmakers in um, Europe, actually, that is a, a short teaser for what we're hoping will be a full-length documentary in the near future. Ninety-nine percent of the ocean is in fact an aquatic desert. The oceans store ninety percent of global warming today. And it's storing that heat in the surface of the ocean in a thick warm layer of water that actually is causing the problem. It's shutting down the currents that go from the deep up to the surface. And when we shut down those currents, we shut down the food source for the plankton. I first had the idea for marine permaculture when I was studying the plankton of the oceans. And I was amazed that half the oxygen we breathe comes from the plankton of the oceans. And it's the plankton forests and the kelp forests that we have to restore in addition to our land forests to really balance the earth and balance carbon in the earth's atmosphere. Kelp forests are one of the most miraculous ecosystems on earth. The kelp forest and the kelp species of Macrocystis is the fastest growing tree on earth. It can grow nearly half a meter per day. These kelp forests are the fastest growing uh, primary production that we have on the planet. And restoring these kelp forests is an opportunity to create an entire ecosystem. Not only are we restoring primary productivity, but we're creating habitat and food for fish. What we're planning to do is in several phases demonstrate the ability to grow kilometer scale forests in the middle of the ocean. So with this vision in mind, the question is how can we actually make it come to pass? So far we've gotten great support from organizations like the Australian federal government, the Department of Foreign Affairs, which had the Blue Economy Challenge and has helped a, almost a dozen companies and organizations uh, to restore these kind of systems in the ocean, open ocean systems like this and also aquaculture systems. In addition, we have support from a, a wide variety of organizations that have helped us to get this far. And the challenge and the question is, um, well, I'd like to describe the problem briefly and then where we can actually go with it. So the problem off the California coast in particular is especially acute because here shown on the right, 
Uh, you, we've got some pictures of the kelp in green and the shoreline in brown showing in 2008 what the kelp coverage looked like. And it's true that over the last eight years, well, on the left here, you can see the temperature of the water back in um, 2011. And then more recently, um, in 2014, you can see how much warmer the water's gotten. And that's a combination of global warming, the big warm blob, and El Nino. And then by, 2000, uh, by 2015, it was even more extreme. And the question is, what kind of effect does this have on the seaweeds? And you can see in 2014, the change in the kelp cover. And this is a foundational species, right? It's providing habitat for forage fish, it's pro providing food itself with resulting effects on all the life in that ecosystem. The net result is we had thousands of starving sea lions right here. I mean, Sausalito had this rescue league, right? And we had this, this happening up and down our coast. And a lot of the cause is associated because they eat fish. The sardine fishery dropped by an order of magnitude in 2008. We had over a million tons. And by 2014, we had less than 100,000 tons. So we lost 90% of the sardine fishery in that time, with a resulting effect on pinnipeds and on seabirds that was devastating. So I asked the question, what can we do to make this ecosystem more resilient at the same time that we're doing sustainable harvesting and enabling that to work? And that was really the inspiration. Now, it came from a related problem in the Indian Ocean, and that was specifically for the Blue Economy Challenge, where in countries like Zanzibar, there are 10,000 subsistence seaweed farmers. But I found from my trip there in March that they can no longer grow the premium seaweed. They did in previous decades, Eukema cottonii, which is a very good red seaweed that's used for food uh, products. Unfortunately, uh, in the last five or 10 years, the water's gotten too warm with not enough nutrients, and they can't grow that seaweed. So they're growing a poorer seaweed, but a lot of them are just leaving the industry. And we're seeing the same thing beginning in Indonesia when I was there in April, and the water, again, was too warm this last winter, and the crops that I went to visit and talked to the farmers, less than 50% yields because the water never got cold enough. I talked to a, a Bali surfer, and he said, yeah, we never had to wear our wetsuits. It just never got cold. And it never gets cold. You never get the nutrients. You never get the seaweed. So these are the problems that we're dealing with. And I'll tell you, the subsistence farmers are on the front lines. These are the people who, when the climate changes, their crops fail, they don't have food to eat, they don't have the money that they need to keep their family supported. And that's why it's so critical to ensure climate resiliency at the same time that we're ensuring a way uh, to live. And so with that in mind, we look to see how can we use marine permaculture and actually make this work. Well, this Catonia seaweed is much worth far more, and we realize that with a system like marine permaculture, what would it take to bring the Catonia back? Well, before global warming, we had natural upwelling. Wind stress causes the deep water to come up. Those are the nutrients that the seaweed needs. However, with global warming, 93% of it's going in the water, it's a barrier to the upwelling. We don't get the same level of nutrients. We don't get the same amount of nutrients coming to the surface, and we get far less seaweed. So what marine permaculture does is put a soda straw down below the thermocline, below the neutrocline, restore that overturning circulation, and actually get the nutrients back up to the surface, irrigate up to a square kilometer of seaweed, and be able to grow that kelp forest, grow the habitat for fish, and grow the fisheries. And that's the fundamental concept behind it. Now, our vision for the farther future is to have actually a free-floating, self-guided system. This one's depicted off of Hawaii, and the concept is to be able to grow up to a square kilometer of the system. Again, it's below the surface, perhaps 10 or 25 meters below the surface, and that provides the holdfast for the kelp. We've also established buoyancy conditions for the nutrients, so we can literally irrigate that square kilometer of kelp with the deep sea water using wave energy, and we can actually get that, uh, those nutrients to the surface. The system could start in the Monterey Bay, and we could actually uh, have it free-floating across the uh, uh, the northeastern Pacific, potentially, and this could be done in multiple regions around the world. Near term, we see using wave energy to actually restore that overturning circulation using a simple check valve, and I'm very glad that uh, Dan is a plumber because I think plumbing is most of it. <laughs> in fact, if you look at all the parts on our system, it's about 90% plumbing. <laughs> so I'm very happy to hear. And the, so the, the principle behind it is to use renewable energy, locally sourced, right there on the spot, to drive that check valve, bring the water up towards the surface, thermally equilibrate it, irrigate the square kilometer of kelp, and enable the entire system to operate. 
And it turns out we've got a precedent for the self-guided systems. The liquid robotic system in Sunnyvale sailed from here all the way to Australia, and it did it really beautifully using uh, bi-directional satellite communications and associated guidance. So we see marine permaculture as having great potential. A little more detail in terms of how it works is shown in this video. This shows a wave buoy that's going up and down. It's got a steel cable that goes down to the check valve. And the idea in this case for a vertical pipe is being able to uh, enable that um, mechanical energy to actually pump water up towards the surface. So we think a combination of that along with a nice submerged seaweed array is really a key. This shows the check valve opening and closing. And one of the great things, we actually deployed this system back in 2008, and it worked remarkably well. We worked with the University of Hawaii, and after two days of operation, we grew enough algae that uh, we got a visitor, and it was a 17-foot-long whale shark. And so this guy was eating algae that we'd made two weeks later after the system running. And we were so thrilled to have this, along with, you'll notice a few forage fish hanging around behind him. And I was very interested in the forage fish and the game fish because they actually were showing the way forward. And that is, it's not only about algae, it's also about forage fish and about game fish that feed on them. And what I noticed, there weren't enough forage fish. And I realized that there were plenty of forage fish that were growing, but they had no habitat. And that's where the real motivation to put the macroalgae back in. Because after all, sardines and other forage fish hang out in the kelp. They love that habitat. It's a nursery for those forage fish. So it's a real opportunity as I see it. Now, the kelp forests today are a thin ribbon and a, even a thinner ribbon over time uh, along the very edges of the continents. And I love this view of the world because we really should have called it planet ocean. And from that perspective, we should have, um, you know, it, it's mostly ocean. And so I look at the 100 million square kilometers between here and Australia as accessible region. That can, it's, a, it's a region that is 99% ocean desert, but that can actually be regionally restored to the, its original productivity level in spite of global warming, and actually bring the kelp forests back and help, help them thrive and restore the fisheries. 13 of 17 global fisheries are collapsed today, including the Monterey sardine fishery. This kind of technology can bring the sardine fishery back to what it once was. And that's what I'd like to see for our entire coastal industries, is being able to do that on a regional scale and a larger scale. And so that's the overall concept we have. In addition, we're working with the Australian government to see how can we can use that cooling water, that effect that happens with the marine permaculture, to actually seasonally cool some of the Great Barrier Reef and stave off what's been the Hiroshima and Nagasaki of coral reefs. Last year was 65% mortality in the northern part of the reef. And this year, for my colleagues in Cairns, 50% additional mortality in the central reef from Port Douglas to Townsville. So we're seeing, I mean, th this reef is in terrible shape, and the question is, can we do something to save it? Marine permaculture can at scale potentially save kilometers, if not hundreds of kilometers of this reef and keep them cool enough. We actually tested this in American Samoa, where we did a coral uh, water cooling experiment back in 2009 and we got a permit from the government to try it out. We thought it would take a month or two, and in less than 24 hours, we saw the corals come back to color to level five. So we were blown away at how quick the effect was. Half a degree Celsius was enough to bring these corals back to color, and we can do it again on the Great Barrier Reef. So this is an example of what we can do with these systems. Now, we're, we've got a four-phase roadmap here. We've done phase one off of Hawaii, and that was to demonstrate the wave-driven pumps and the check valves. Phase two is being funded right now, and we're going, I'm leaving on Sunday for Woods Hole. We're gonna design and build the first marine permaculture that'll grow red seaweeds. And then we'll deploy that later this year in the Indian Ocean and test it out. We're fundraising for phase three, and that is to deploy a system in the Pacific that can use macrocystis. We could build it right off Monterey. And again, these are designed to be uh, ocean-going vessels. They're ocean-going vessels that have seaweed, that actually have fish. And in phase four, we take it to a thousand meter scale. So this is our plan for the future. We want to enable this industry to happen and do it sustainably. And really, we're at the very beginning of this incredible industry where we'll be able to grow millions of, um, potentially millions of square kilometers of, uh, of kelp and restore life to the oceans. So we're super enthusiastic about making the system going. We have engineers and technologists from around the world. We need all sorts of talent, and we're looking to build capacity and raise funds to really bring on the next stage. We see enormous potential here. The biggest risk is that of doing nothing. And so our inspiration is to help restore life to the ocean. And we mean the plant life and the macroalgae, as well as the fish that can actually make it go. 
So we're looking for support in all sorts of ways, and we look forward to engaging with you and explore how we can do that. And thank you so much for your attention. What we'll have time for in a moment to just uh, what we committed to for the evening is we're going to have a, a breakout discussion, two discussions, and the various topics of discussion will enable a lot of Q&A with everybody here because there's actually a tremendous amount of intellectual surface area in the room of practitioners um, of various stages and scales. Um, and so uh, maybe actually in the spirit of that, uh, maybe if you could uh, raise your hand if you are a, a farmer, a shellfish, kelp, um, if you are doing some practice in the ocean or near shore or estuary environment today. Foragers, Foragers as well, yeah. Okay, so that you can see that there's a few people in here who are actually practitioners on the ground who can contribute to, they could have been speakers up here as well with the important work that they're doing. Um, it's just we, we only have so much time that we've dedicated here together tonight. Um, so we will break out in just a moment and that's that kind of for the balance of the evening. Uh, before we get there though, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, uh, our, uh, one of our sponsors for the evening. And again, Aaron accurately described him as uh, a very prescient climate change thinker. The solutions that we've seen tonight, both uh, Dan and Brian's projects, um, have this ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere, sequester it into biomass, and sometimes sink it down to the, the seabed floor, sometimes put it into the labile carbon cycle, but also replace and mitigate other emissions that would have happened from land-based agriculture. Extraordinarily important work in, the, in, the, in terms of the carbon cycle overall. And uh, one of our you know, local cl carbon heroes, climate heroes, um, John, would like to maybe frame some up from, for the discussions, um, frame some of this for us. John, do you want to? Great, great to see this good, good turnout, and uh, just wanted to just keep my, my uh, remarks brief. Um, you know, as a young boy, I spent a lot of time in the tide pools in the uh, San Juan Islands in the Pacific Northwest, and in my little, little boat, you know, maneuvering around the, the, the kelp forests. And, you know, today, um, living part of the time up in Sonoma County, I, you know, I just see, you know, the, the kelp forests are disappearing. It's really, really a sad thing to see this happening. Um, I, by the way, I wanted to mention, there's something called a forest in the sea. It's a video that you have to watch. Uh, just Google on YouTube, and it's a, it sh they shot it in 1982 before there was some big storms, and it's kind of like a time capsule of what the coast off of California used to look like of the kelp forest and all the different sea life. Uh, uh, it was it's very inspiring. Uh, a forest in the sea at YouTube. Uh, definitely want to check that out. Um, and as an organic food entrepreneur, I founded Nativa in 1999 with a goal to revolutionize the way the world eats. And about three years ago, I became <clears throat> inspired to see the link between agriculture and climate change. And ironically, we spend 99% of our time in the climate movement focused on solar and wind and, and coal and ignore agriculture, the number one contributor to climate change, more than Chevron and Exxon, the transportation industry combined. And then, so, and I've been kind of worked on articles and helped produce a conference called Soil Not Oil. We, we, we host every year in, in uh, September uh, with about three, 400 people come to that. And as I started to realize this, that really the ocean is the sink for all this carbon. <clears throat> so agriculture, I, I wrote an article about how Starbucks, which is one of the largest sellers of, of, of industrial dairy in the world, is basically a destroyer of the seas, you know, based in Seattle, you know, a place where the salmon and, and, the, and the whales are, are so close to their corporate headquarters. People have no idea that every time you buy a Starbucks you know, coffee with, with dairy in it, you're supporting this. And we really got to change how we grow our food. Um, and, and just in the last year, I started to see, okay, well, what are we going to do with the carbon? Like, okay, yeah, we can do solar, but what are we going to do with the carbon? And, and this idea of ocean farming where we can, where we can uh, you know, grow the kelp, and I think we need more research, but I really feel this is kind of on the cutting edge of some, uh, of some solutions, and that's what I'm, what I'm interested in about. And, and I, I see so many people, they think, well, climate change, well, by 2100, how many times have we see in the New York Times that oceans are gonna rise by four feet? It's like, who's in charge of the communications in this climate movement? It's like, whoever they are, it's like, uh, I think they should be fired. It's like, you do the surveys, half the people think it's not gonna impact them in their lifetime, you know? And I'm the person who's, I've been writing articles, I wrote an article in, uh, in EcoWatch and giving some, some talks to different areas. Of, we did a climate change, uh, a day at the uh, Expo uh, West, the largest nat natural food event in the world, 
or, or second maybe out, out of Europe, and you know, showing that if we don't do anything, so much carbon is going to go in the ocean that the plankton is going to die, and by 2040, 90% of all species in the ocean will be gone. And that means that's where the oxygen is. So we're going to be gone. So you know, we're, we're part of this kind of galactic, you know, this change that's going on right now. And if we don't do anything about it, that's what's going to happen. Or, as I like to say, we have an app for that, and that's regenerative agriculture and ocean restoration. And ironically, the agencies that should be working on the solution are missing in action. They're actually trying to prevent this. They just, because, you know, they just, the, the, they're, they're, they're not understanding this. But slowly that's starting to change. I think there's awareness in this move and the fact that there are people here in this room as part of that. So, so it's really exciting to, to come together here. You know, we have a short window. And I really think we've seen some really interesting technology and, uh, and some opportunities. I'm so excited to, to learn about this and see how we can educate more people and really grow the awareness. And so, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take change. It's going to take people working hard and come up with some solutions. And that was the hope to, to uh, working with Lyft Economy. And I, I want to let's, let's give them a hand for putting this on today. Yeah.